And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us to go to prepare you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There prepare for us. The disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and said to, to him, one to another, one after another, Is it I? And he said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took the bread, and after blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And as he took the cup and he gave thanks, he gave to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had uh, sung a hymn, they went out to the mount of olives. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word and the word to our heart and to our mind. You may be seated. Our Bibles are marked, our Bibles are open to these verses, again, that I have entitled Supping with Sinners and Living Like Saints. And I imagine there is tension between both of those in our lives to, to identify as being a sinner and simultaneously a saint set apart to serve a holy and righteous God. And we are thankful that the Lord has given us the gift of His Word to handle and to hold and to live out and to stand in the assembly and read together and to know that God has spoken and He wants us to know exactly what He says to His church. He wants you to know what He says to you and to us. Today's sermon deals with the Passover meal and the betrayal that happens within Jesus' hand-picked Disciples, if, if one has a hard time uh, understanding the sovereignty and the supernatural foreknowledge of our Lord God, if there is a person under the sound of my voice today or maybe one who is watching in their home who has a hard time with the foreknowledge of God, of God or, or His sovereignty, I want you to examine these verses closely together with me today. I want you to note right from the beginning, right from the onset, that Jesus called Judas knowing that he would betray him. And for the sake of the cross, for the sake of his passion, Jesus called a person that he knew that would betray him. I would imagine that every one of us in here identify more with Judas than we would probably the rest of the disciples. And that, my friends, is a deep-seated Love. What does the Bible tell us about our God? That He is a God of love, doesn't it? That our God is a God of love. C.S. Lewis wrote of God's love saying this. C.S. Lewis said, God's love, God loves us not because we are lovable, because He is love. Not because He needs to receive, it is because He delights to give. You know that our God delights to give good things to us? He delights in giving good and righteous and wholesome things to His people. 
In fact, He desires us to pursue Him and to pursue good and righteous things. With our Bible still open, I want to present a sermon to you in these few verses in front of us, supping with sinners and living like saints. And there are three parts to this that I want to bring out. These are the three P's that I see in this sermon. Number one is preparation. Number two is prediction. And number three is partaking or Passover. So let's begin. Number one, planning and preparation. How do we see preparation in these verses? This would be, according to God's Word and the nature and character of Jesus Christ, this would be a level of preparation that is on the scale of eternality. This is the eternal, sovereign preparation of a holy God. So I pray that you understand that the Lord God that we serve is a God of love, but He is also a God of order and He is a God of design. At least we doubt that. Skim through the book of Leviticus. He is a God of order, and He is a God of design. And as much as we like to pride ourselves at Piney Grove Baptist Church as being people who like order and design, we we like to have things orderly, don't we? We like to pride ourselves to having things in order, and there's nothing wrong with that as as, as long as we understand that we do so to worship our Lord God and to give every bit of excellence to Him, no matter how we might pride ourselves in being organized and together next to the God of creation and next to the God of order, our orderliness looks like an episode of Hoarders. Have you ever seen that show? I had a hard time watching one or two episodes. But next to God's orderliness, we resemble something of that. Verse 12, And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare to eat the Passover? He sent two out. He said, Go into the city, and you will find a man carrying a jar of water. Meet him. When you meet him, you follow him. Now, in verse 1, And verse 2, information was set and given to set the stage for the following events. It was two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which would have stretched through seven days. The atmosphere in the city, as we already know, whenever Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, and the people began to scream, Hosanna, Hosanna, and he went into the temple. He turned over the money, uh, the money changer's table, and he had an altercation there between the scribes, the Pharisees. He had an argument with them. There, in that argument, began to fester this atmosphere that was heavy and tense with the chief priests and the scribes seeking an opportunity how they might take the life of the Lord Jesus. And so Jesus, as we look at last week's episode, Jesus is anointed at Bethany by a former uh, lady of the city, according to the Gospel of Luke. And she is forever memorialized in the Gospel as a person with a generous and humble persona. Remember last week we said these are good attributes for a Christ follower. As Jesus lives and works through us, to seek humility and generosity. Remember we said that even as the woman explained some exemplary characteristics for us to follow, that the hero of the story is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ as our example, to live out being generous and and humble. And this woman was forever memorialized in the gospel as as a woman that was generous and humble. The Lord in His infinite wisdom had planned The eternal plan, in fact, from the foundation of the world, that the Lamb, the Son of God, the Son of Man, was to be slain in correspondence with the Passover. And it was planned and orchestrated in such a magnificent way that we certainly see God's hand in it. On this seven-day stretch, this Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples asked if Jesus and they were to also participate in the Passover. As dull as the disciples might have have been at times, 
This time the Lord did not prompt his disciples. He did not ask them on the importance of this worshipful event. In fact, it was on every uh, Hebrew's tongue. It was in the vernacular of the Hebrew to worship on the Passover, to think about the Passover, to reflect about that Passover. In fact, it was in the vernacular of every single Hebrew that was seeking to worship God accordingly that the Lord God brought them out of Egypt. Do you remember a time when God brought you out of Egypt? Do you remember a time when I was going to go through the land of Goshen and I was going to strike all the firstborn dead, but you obeyed and you marked your mantle with the blood of that lamb and I passed over you? This was in the vernacular of every Hebrew who wanted to to worship appropriately. And so the disciples did not have to think twice. In fact, they prompted the Lord, aren't we going to worship the Passover and observe the the Feast of Unleavened Bread? In fact, when observed correctly, it brought one to a worshipful place, a time of reflection, a time of contemplation, a a time of memorial, remembering the sovereignty of God, remember the strong hand of the Lord. This was also in the vernacular of every Hebrew, the hand of God, the strong hand of, of the Lord to contemplate on that and to contemplate on the eternal dominion and provision of God Almighty. Do you believe that God provides for you today? Do you believe that God meets your needs? Number one, He met your need of salvation. That is the greatest need any person ever born would ever need, and that is the provision of salvation from Jesus Christ. Psalm 104 verse 24 says, O Lord, how manifold are your works. We stand in all of his works. In wisdom have you made them all. All the earth is full of your creatures. Now being in Bethany, Jesus and company now travel to Jerusalem, the only place where the Passover is to be observed, at least at this time. And one question that arises from the last supper discourse is this. Why didn't they prepare a lamb? On the eve of the Passover lamb, was, the lamb was to be sacrificed. It was to be roasted. And it was to be eaten in remembrance of the first Passover, just as we see in Exodus chapter 12. They had the bread, the unleavened bread. They had the spices. The spices would be a reminder of the bitterness in the wilderness. Uh, dipping in the spices would remind them, of, remind them of the bitter time and trial, the 40 days, of the 40 years, I should say, in the wilderness. It reminded this, um, them of that, the bitterness there. So they had the, the bread, they had the spices, they had the wine, but no lamb. The question is easier to answer than one might think. See, Jesus is the spotless lamb. Jesus is the spotless once and for all lamb to be slain. And so there is no need for them to slay a lamb and to feast when the lamb of God is amongst them, when the lamb to be slain was supping with sinners. So he sends out two disciples into the city. He finds a man carrying a jar of water. And Luke identifies the disciples here as Peter and John. So here is Jesus, this master master organizer in all of his foreknowledge, knowing that there will be a man carrying water and who knows the Lord. He knows the Lord, whether it is a relationship that he has built with the Lord or the Lord looked down and supernaturally in his foreknowledge knew that this, this man and this man would know him. See, men aren't at this time, usually known for carrying water through the city. This was normally, during these times, a job that uh, the women would, would uh, encounter. Now, that is not for us to say the scriptures are chauvinistic in any way. This is the culture in which they lived. And so it it would be out of place to see a man carrying water. So obviously this person would stand out. I love the comment from theologian Adam Clark here on this particular man in this story. Sometimes we gloss over little nuggets of truth and wisdom that are in God's Word. Adam Clark said of this man carrying the water and and reminds us that God can use all of us if we are willing. Amen? 
God can use all of us if we are willing. I want you to listen to what Adam Clark said here. He said, how correct is the foreknowledge of Jesus Christ? Even the minutest circumstances are comprehended by it. That is his foreknowledge. An honest employment, howsoever mean, is worthy the attention of God. And even a man bearing a pitcher of water is marked in all of his steps and is an object of the merciful regards of the Most High. This man was employed in carrying home the water which was to be used for the baking of the unleavened bread on the following day. And as the woman was memorialized forever in the canon of Scripture as being a person of generosity and a person that was, that was known to be not only of generous spirit but also of humility, this man will forever be canonized in Scripture as having and partaking of something that we memorialize every single second Sunday of the month, and that is the communion. This man will be known in the canon of Scripture in some way of having a part in supping with the Lord. So the Lord can use us where we're at. Wherever we're at. If it's expositing the Word, preaching, teaching, carrying a glass of water to someone in need. Whatever it is, the Lord can use you where you're at. Then in verse 14, he, uh, wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you this large furnished upper room and there prepare for us, prepare the meal there. And the disciples set out and they went into the city and they found it just as he had told them and they prepared the Passover. See, the homes in this region had homes in the lower levels and then one or two in the upper room. We find this in Mark chapter 2. There was an upper room and sometimes even the scribes or people of the law would find themselves on the roofs of these houses contemplating and talking about the law together. And in some places also there are are, uh, what we might call today community buildings or community centers where people can secure a place uh, for themselves or for their family, specifically travelers. These rooms were available mainly because travelers would come to observe the, the, the Passover together. And the disciples seemed to obey the Lord without question and to prepare the Passover, uh, to prepare the Passover meal in this upper room. Now, uh, most, of, most of growing in the Lord Jesus, I want you to notice that we see the example of the man that they find as being forever canonized in Scripture as a man God used in a small way, but in a big way on our end. But we also see the disciples followed through the Lord's command almost without question. It is almost as if they trusted in the Word of God. And most of our growing in the Lord, I must remind you, most of our growing in the Lord Jesus will deal with us trusting God at His Word. To know and to trust in what the Lord God says as truth is vitally important to grow in our faith. You know, and the old statistic, I, I, don't, I, I don't have an accurate statistic, but it At one time, it was 90% of church splits are over little minute things, such as hanging a picture, the color of the carpet, those type things. Hopefully, COVID has straightened out some of those things. But I believe that much of the problems in churches today has to do with not trusting in God to provide. At the core of this episode is a loving God willing to give his life freely to a ragtag group of misfits who we all identify with. My friends, we are the ragtag disciples. We are the ragtag misfits. But they are willing to obey God at his word and trust him at his word. Thomas Kempitz said this, Instant obedience is the only kind of obedience that there is because delayed obedience is disobedience. Now, here is the Lord in His foreknowledge. He had His disciples go to prepare a place really at the core of it to worship. 
Remember, Jesus is leaving his disciples in charge of making other disciples. And so to make other disciples, I I submit to you, we must know and trust and obey the word of God. Really, if you look at this episode, that is exactly what Jesus is doing. He was sending out his disciples so they might themselves make other disciples to learn what it means to make disciples. The Lord is sending them out to work, to prepare, and we must do the same today. Not only is there the preparation, but then there is also the chilling prediction. There is also the prediction that we find. In verse 17, the Bible says, The evening had came, and he with the twelve, and they met together. In verse 18, they were reclining at the table, and they were eating. And Jesus said, as they were eating, sitting back, as they would in that time, and was their custom to recline backwards. Jesus said, truly I say, or verily I say to you, that one of you will betray me, the one who is eating with me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say to Jesus, one after another, is it I? And, and the verbiage that is used here in the original language is that there was a progressive, uh, I believe the, the message of Easter, the drama captures this quite well. As it says, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? There is a progression or an ongoing asking of this question. Is it me, dear Lord? Is it, am I the one that, am, that, that is betraying you? And so here's the scene. Everything is... Set for worship, the evening of the Passover was upon them. One of the most important portions of any worship time, any time of worship, is obviously the focus of the object of worship, who is the Lord Jesus, and then the laser-like focus on our shortcomings and sin. If you are part of a worship service and those elements are missing, I pray that the Lord would do a mighty work in that congregation and in that church to bring those elements back into focus. Because every worship service you ever attend, every time of worship that you have, it must be, number one, a focus on the object of worship, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, and then our laser light focus on shortcoming and sin and to repent. Any worship that is void of these elements is short-sighted. Now, I know that we've been ingrained to think that worship is supposed and only supposed to make us feel good. I believe that, that as we worship, we will feel inspired. And, and sometimes our feelings will deceive us, right? As a heart is wicked and sick. Sometimes we can deceive ourselves. Now, I also believe that when you leave this place, every time you leave, I believe you ought to leave the place and say to yourself, today we worship the living Christ. But we always don't feel good, do we? We're going through trials, tribulations. It should worship be inspiring and uplifting? Absolutely. But sometimes worship is not only about making us feel good. Because sometimes the Holy Spirit will convict us of our sins. And sometimes we need to repent of those sins. And that is a bitter, sweet tension. Bitter in the fact that I have sinned and I have offended a holy God. And I've got to do something about it. As a believer. But the sweetness about it is, He is willing to forgive us. Amen. Sometimes rightful worship of the Word will bring us to a place of humility and reproof. Sometimes we need a good Spiritual spanking. So the disciples are here. They're reclining with the Lord at the table. And Jesus begins this discourse on self-examination. This is the time when all of the disciples say, Is it I? You know, I believe that, that many of us today have lost that element of worship, Is it I? When there is a word of the Lord that has gone forward, and we know for a fact It feels that the preacher has put a bullseye on our back, and that's not the case. 
But we feel as if the word has somehow spoke to us and now I must act upon, upon that word. As where our first reaction should be, is it, is it I? Is, the, is this word talking about me? Is the preacher talking about me? Is the word talking about me? Instead of saying, is it I? I believe many of us today find it isn't me. That's not me. That's not me. I believe we have lost this element when the preaching of the word has gone forth or the teaching of God's word has gone forth to say, is that me? Is it I? Now, I know that we're, we're talking about Judas as, as he will betray and sell out the Lord Jesus. And I know that. And how many times have we heard a word from the Lord and instead of saying, is it I, we find ourselves saying, it isn't me, I, that can't be me. Instead of asking the Lord to reveal our guilt and shame, we say, preacher can't be possibly talking about me. I'll never forget preaching a sermon. I may have shared this one time before, but I remember preaching a sermon, and it was, uh, it was on um, the devil is a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And I'll never forget this, walking out as we were dismissing a deacon at the time, looked at me and pointed to the seat where this dear saint of the Lord sat and said, she really needed to hear that today. I believe in some regard we have lost that. Is this me? John Bunyan, who wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, who also wrote a little piece called The Straight Gate, said this of Judas and the disciples. He said, there will be many that were gallant professors in this world, wanting among the saved in the city of Christ's coming, yea, many whose damnation was never dreamed of. Which of the twelve ever thought that Judas would have proved to be a devil? Nay, when Christ suggests that one amongst them was not, they each were more afraid of themselves than of him. This prediction had them all on edge and wondering, and I believe that we have lost this somewhere over the years, this self-examination as the Holy Spirit begins to work and draw us to a place of offering and giving it to, to the Lord and in repentance. But he said to them, it is the one of the twelve who is dipping the bread in the dish with me you know that Jesus was not taken by surprise by this. In fact, Psalm 41, verse 9, says this of this poetic prediction. Verse 9, Psalm 41 says, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Don't you know that God, who has sovereignly prepared uh, this and knew this, was not caught by surprise? The one who dips the bread in the dish is the one. And somehow the rest of the disciples missed that Judas was the one. It escaped their attention. But Judas knew. Judas knew that the Lord Jesus was on to him. In fact, the gospel expositor and evangelist Matthew said this. Matthew 26, verse 25. Judas asked this question. Is it I? To which Jesus' response was, you have said so. And then verse 21, For the Son of Man goes as it is written of Him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Such a stinging accusation, but more than an accusation, absolute truth. See, this verse is portioned around the word woe. I challenge you, when you go home and you have a concordance or you have an electronic version of the Bible that will let you do a word search, I challenge you to type in the word woe, W-A-E. Hit enter. See what you get. See what you find. Woe is a strong word that always denotes the finality of God's judgment. When godly, righteous judgment is issued, there is no remedy. Now, let me rephrase that. There is no remedy other than the blood of Jesus. 
as we are in our sin, before we knew Jesus, before we were in Christ, we were in our sin, we were in our brokenness, a woe unto us, to you, is appropriately applied. But I want to thank God for His grace and His salvation. Somebody thank God for that. A woe is appropriately applied unto us, but thank God for His grace and His salvation. See, this great prediction, it didn't catch the Lord by surprise. We look at the events of the world today, injustices in the world, true injustices in the world. And we look at the world around us, and we act as if this is some great surprise to us, sinners acting like sinners. Who knew? But our God knows, right? This betrayal to come by Judas, was already known, even sanctioned by the Lord. Before Judas was ever in the womb, God knew. See, this is the case when betrayal was used or was used for the glory of God. And by the way, history is full of God using evil and making it good. Read the book of Genesis with the account of Jacob and his brothers. And probably one of the most famous, famous verses, most well-known verses in that discourse, in that narrative, is where Joseph addresses his brothers and says, What you have intended for evil or meant for evil, God has used for, for good. And the world is full in the events of the world today and history. What man has meant to be evil, God has used for His goodness and for His glory. It is full of the Lord using something for evil and turning it for good. I think of the story of William Tyndall. William Tyndall is such a success story as this. We wouldn't look at it and say it was success, but we, as we look at Tyndall's legacy, we would say certainly is. William Tyndall was the first person that we know to translate the Bible from Greek and Hebrew into the English language, making the Bible accessible to the common people. What this would mean, would that it would mean that it was taking the interpretation of the Word of God away from the popes and the clergy and putting into the hands of the common folk. And as you can imagine, the Catholic Church was not too happy about this endeavor. Now, the whole goal of Tyndall was to put the Bible in the hands of the common man so that they can read the Bible on their own without the need of the Pope or the Catholic Church for translation. And so in 1535, our friend of old, William Tyndall, was betrayed by his friend Henry Phillips. Tyndall was taken prisoner. He was taken to a castle near Brussels. There he continued to work on his translation by God's glory and by God's sovereignty. Somehow he was able to finish his translation or to work on it. He was unable to finish it all the way, but he was sentenced to die a heretic's death by strangulation and then burning at the stake. On, April, on October the 6th, not too far of the anniversary, October 6th, 1536, he cried out his last word saying, Lord, Open the king of England's eyes, and then he died. Of course, Tyndall's prayer was answered within a year's time. More so, he lived out through the Tyndall translation and ministry that you know still thrives to this day. It goes to show you that God can take something that seems horrible and use it for his glory. Now, Judas betrayed the Lord, but it was known by our Lord that it would, that it would bring him to his passion and to the cross. This is not a question of whether Judas was in God's will or that he would be repented or even saved or a question of predestination. This is a question of God's sovereignty for the greater purpose, the redemption of everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And then lastly, the Passover or the Lord's Supper. I have come to a current conviction 
upon the Lord's Supper that any time that we come across the institution of the Lord's Supper in Scripture, that it must be visualized. And I know last week we were able to commune around the communion table, and you see no communion prepared for us this morning. So what I want to do this morning is I want to observe the elements of the Lord's Supper. I believe that this should be done in a corporate fashion, and so we'll offer that in just a moment. Last week we observed the Lord's Supper, and maybe you were not able to be with us last week. And in just a moment, we'll offer you that opportunity. But in this one moment, I want to, I want to offer communion. Next to the Lord Jesus, my family is the greatest treasure that I have. And certainly my wife, Tracy, today... So I'm going to observe the elements of the Lord's Supper with her first. And then we'll work through the verses together. What do you think? I'm going to, I'm going to observe the Lord's Supper with her. Now we got these things that are a little difficult to unwrap, but we're going to do so. So in this is the preparation of the Passover. In this is not only the Passover, but it is also the preparation of the New Covenant. So let's read the scriptures together. This is what we would consider to be the institution of the Lord's Supper. The evening had came, he had took the bread, and he blessed it, and he gave it to them, and he said, take this, this is my body. And he would go on in the later gospel, say, do this in remembrance of me. This, of course, would be remembrance of the Lord as he would die on the cross and his blood His blood would be shed down Calvary's tree. And I don't think that we even have any remote idea of the level of savagery that happened on the cross. We have our inclinations of what happened on the cross. But I believe it even escapes our imagination. Jesus had took the cup, and when he had given thanks to them, they all drank it. And he said to them, this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. And truly I say to you, that I will not drink it of the fruit of the vine until that day when I will drink it new in the kingdom of God. And we do this in remembrance of him. And in these verses, the Lord Jesus will institute what is known to us today as the sacrament, as the Eucharist, as the Lord's Supper. This is an amazing culmination of what Israel was longing for but did not realize the significance of it. The Messiah would be the spotless Lamb of God, the once and for all sacrifice for sin. Imagine, there would be no more need For the brutal slaying of a lamb and the bloody scene that happened on the altar in the Old Testament as they would bring those lambs in, a spotless lamb, they were almost knee deep in the blood, a tragic and horrible scene. In fact, on the Hebrew calendar, Yom Kippur, that we know as being the Day of Atonement, I want you to know that Yom Kippur 2021 began Wednesday, September the 15th at sunset. And it ended Thursday, September the 16th at nightfall. And I want you to know this. The very day that I was preparing my notes for this passage was Yom, when Yom Kippur would have ended. Wednesday, that 16th, or Thursday the 16th, I was ending my notes on this very passage. Yom Kippur was about to end. It was 6.42 p.m., September the 16th, just minutes away from our sunset. So I put my notes up. I stopped in that moment to thank the Lord Jesus that he became our atonement forever. 
not only just the day of atonement, but forever atonement, offered through his sacrifice and his blood. And through it all, the Lord Jesus shows his love by preparing a way for us. Not only did he prepare the meal, but he prepared a way for us to now come to the Lord in the righteousness of the Son. He predicted it long ago, so nothing surprises our Lord. And now we, sup- we celebrate a new Passover, a new covenant, every time we reflect upon the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus. Aren't you glad that He knew? Aren't you glad that He supplied a way for you to be saved? So what I want to do in this next few moments is uh, I want to sing a song. Trust and obey. Uh, that will be also in your, in your hymnal at 571. But I also want to offer you an opportunity. If you would like to commune with your family, just you and your family, I'll ask you, head of home or whoever it might be, I've got these prepackaged deals up here. And if you would like to commune with your family as we sing Trust and Obey, I'm going to leave them on the table. You come collect what you need for your family. And we'll sing, trust, and obey until you finish. Then we'll pray and dismiss together. Dan, if you'll come and lead us on that piano. I'm going to leave these right here. If you and your family would like to commune, I'll leave this right here. And we're going to sing, trust and obey. We'll ask you if you will, let's stand together.